Hi guys, it's Tony Robbins. You're listening to Habits and Hustle. Crush it. Even though I'm an, a married ha- an old married hag, I have to tell you, <laughs> uh, I found your book to be like super fun and it's interesting because what I loved about it is that you can actually apply it to like relationships across the board, right? Like why totally. you pick, right? So hold on, let me just introduce you, okay? So your name is uh, I have Lo- Logan Yuri, is that yeah, how you talk to us? It, yeah. Logan Yuri, okay, so um, who's a behavior scientist um, on the podcast today, and she wrote the book "How to Not Die Alone," which I love the title too. Um, and like I like I was saying, you know, you know, even if you're not single and you're just kind of somebody who's just a, a, a person in the world in dealing with other human beings through work, or whatever else, it's very, very practical. Like, the, like your book was. I love how you broke things down into tendencies and what like attachment theory. I just love, I really did. I loved your book. Thank you so much. I'm really happy to hear you say that. And yes, I think it was super important to me that it be practical. I think there are a lot of good books out there about the theories of love and how love works and all these things. And like, I just wanted to give people what I give people in a coaching session, which is like, this is what your problem is. Do this. It'll get better. Absolutely. And that's what I liked about it. It was very matter of fact. And, uh, you know, yeah, like I said, I I'm an old married hag, but I have a lot of friends who yeah. are actually single, and you know, or they're on their sec, they're, they're they're getting divorced or divorced and back out in the single world, and it's like a very I, I find it very interesting. I think you and you touch upon this a lot, like how social media, like how people compare and despair, which we'll get into, which I think is so true. I'm so happy that I'm not somebody dating in today's uh, time because it's. You know, you could just keep on swiping and, you know, nobody, it's like you forget about, you could have, you could have swiped 30 great people and yet your brain is like instant gratification. You can, you forget because you're on to the next, on to the next, you know? Um, so yeah, let's just go right into it, cool. Logan. Okay. Yeah. So, so you're a behavior scientist. So tell us a little bit about your background, what you do, like, and how science, how, what you did was you applied the, the, behavior science and the science uh, behind dating relationships, you know, all that. Yeah. So my background's in behavioral science, which is the study of how we make decisions. And I studied psychology in college. I also had a secondary in women and gender and sexuality. So I've sort of always been interested in the psychology of how our brains work and how we make decisions, and then also sort of how it applies to dating and relationships. And so my exciting job out of college was running this behavioral science team at Google. And so that meant taking academic research about how people make decisions and applying it within Google to Google marketing, Google products, Google employees. And I really love that. And I worked with one of my academic heroes, Dan Ariely. But at the same time, I was single and the dating apps had just started and I was struggling and people around me were struggling too. And so I just thought, how can I take what I do for work, which is help people make better decisions, help people get out of their own way? How can I apply that to dating and relationships? So that's what I've been doing in a couple different capacities as a dating coach, really doing hands-on coaching with people one-on-one or with couples saying, you know, I'm identifying this pattern. This is your dating blind spot. This is what you should do proactively to overcome it. Then I do it through the book, which applies behavioral science to dating and relationships. And then now I've been working for the last year as the director of relationship science at the dating app hinge. And so I'm (laughs) actually doing it on a really broad scale, helping millions of people Mm -hmm. figure out what are the people doing who are able to find success on a dating app? And how can we teach you how to do that as well? So that's really the thing that I'm most proud of is that I had these two passions, psychology and decision-making theory, and then dating and relationships or what's called relationship science. And I've been able to marry the two and approach this topic that, you know, there are a lot of books about love and dating, but approach this topic in a new and scientific way. Yeah. And and you did a great job at it. So um, at Google then, so you were, you just talked about that. You have, you had talks at Google, modern romance. So can you talk about that a little bit? What did you exactly do with this background at Google? 
Yeah. So when I was at Google, I realized that there was things, this thing called Talk to Google. And it was basically a platform where you could invite people in to interview them. And I was like, oh, this is amazing. I can use this to meet my heroes. So I cold emailed Ira Glass, who is and was one of my heroes. And I just said, I see you're going to be in California for this speaking oh. event. Would you want to come and do a talk to Google with me? And he said, yes. And I got to spend the day with him. And it was truly a peak life moment. And so I did a couple more of those with some podcasters, um, Roman Mars, uh, Gretchen Rubin, who you probably know. Yeah, I had her on. <laughs> yeah, Gretchen Rubin is incredible. I spent a day with her. She actually encouraged me to write the book that's about to come out. And basically, I was like, oh, I have this platform and I can use it to bring in experts in the field. So I started Talks at Google Modern Romance. And I was able to bring in people like Esther Perel, Dan mm. Savage, Dossie Easton, who's really well known for writing The Ethical Slut, a book about polyamory. It was so cool because I could take a platform I had, this toxic Google interview series, make my own series about dating and relationships. And it really had an impact on people. A thousand people at Google joined the email list within a day. And I think I talk about this in the book. Somebody came up to me at Burning Man and was like, I watched your talk yes. with Dossie Easton about polyamory and I didn't know that that was available to me. And like this changed the way that I see my marriage. This is what kept my marriage together. And it was a moment of understanding within myself that I was doing something that mattered and that I was putting something out there that people didn't have access to otherwise. And there was something beautiful about taking this like very corporate official title of Google, right? This, this mm -hmm. company that's mm -hmm. well-respected, applying it to this area that doesn't necessarily get a lot of scientific inquiry or even, let's say, respect. And by marrying the two, it made it safer for sort of these like Google nerds and then other people watching it on YouTube to actually engage in this topic in a serious way. No, I, I, you just, you just, uh, to your point, you just hit it right there. I mean, I think that's what, it, that was, that was interesting for me to have, to speak with you, right? Was that it was the science behind it and you married it beautifully, right? Because uh, you're right, to your point, I don't think that like in, if we're just talking about dating relationships, it, even if it's not, it seems, it seems a little bit like light and fluffy, right? Totally. But when you bring in the whole idea behind like why you do what you do, the psychology and behavior that that like wh why you pick the people you pick and what does that mean and how do you change it and like all those other things that we're gonna like self regulate. Like, I really like I said like this was kind of like a practical to me, uh, very like a psychological book on how human nature is, um, but done in a very like fun, practical way. So thank you. Um, no, you're welcome. So let's get into something here. Um, you break things down to three dating tendencies, right? And you even have a quiz that people can take, right? Where they can kind of find what, who, like what, what tendency they are and why it's important. You talk about it, that it helps you kind of see, you know, get away from your own. Well, you tell us, but blind spots and, you tell us why it's important and what the, the three tendencies are. Yeah. So I think one of my superpowers is pattern recognition. And what was happening was I had lots of different clients who came from different cultural backgrounds, gender identity, different orientations, but I just kept seeing the same patterns over and over again. And these were what I call the three dating tendencies, which are a set of blind spots. So each tendency has blind spots that are a pattern of behavior or thinking that are holding them back from finding love. But the important part is they can't identify it on their own, right? So if they could, they wouldn't need to come to me. So <laughs> what I did was I organized it into this framework called the three dating tendencies. And what they all have in common is unrealistic expectations. So the first one is the romanticizer. And this person has unrealistic expectations of relationships. So this is someone who expects Prince Charming or Princess Ariel. They think that love is effortless, that love is going to find them, that putting effort into a relationship means that it's not working because if it were your soulmate, it would be effortless. And so they have this very particular view what's called the soulmate mindset. And they think that they know exactly the package the person's going to come in and they know that love is going to find them. 
Uh, the next one is called the maximizer and they have unrealistic expectations of their partner. So many of my dating coaching clients fit into this category. And these are people who say, I'm pretty happy, but could I be 5% happier? And they feel like life is something that can be researched. You know, you go to wire cutter and you find the best espresso machine. Why wouldn't you date everyone you could and figure out the exact perfect person? And their view of relationships is that it's all about the choosing. You have to choose the perfect person. Person, and you need to be 100% certain before you walk down the aisle with someone. The third type is called the hesitator. And these people have unrealistic expectations of themselves. So these are the people who say, I'll date when I lose 10 pounds. I'll date when I have more money in the bank. I'll date when I get that promotion. I'll date when I move. And why would I date before them? And they think that one day they'll wake up and feel ready to date. And they only want to put themselves out there when they feel like they are their best selves, but they're underestimating two things. One is that by dating, you figure out who you want to be with. And two, by dating, you get better at dating. It's like stand-up comedy. You can't do stand-up comedy without an audience and you yeah. can't do dating without going on a date. You actually need to be investing time in those skills because someone out there just like you is going on a date and figuring that out. And by waiting until you're quote unquote, 100% ready, you're missing out on the chance to learn how to do that. You know, but how about people like, you know, like some of my friends, I have this one of my best, best friends. He's like a great, I say he's a great catch, right? Like, and, and um, he is a great catch. He's a doctor. He's very successful. He's great looking. Um, and yeah, and he, and he's also self-aware, right? Like, so even, I guess my question is even when you are self-aware and you know why you do what you do or you know what tendency you are, but yet you still can't help yourself, but, but keep on going through the same patterns. Like you said, you're a big, you're all about pattern recognition. So what if you're someone who can recognize your pattern, right? And know what you're doing, but yet that's not enough to kind of change the behavior. Yeah. So that's why behavioral science is so interesting because a lot of people think that if you just give people information that that's not, that that's enough. Yeah. And we know from behavioral science that that's not true. So a famous example is in New York, they added the calorie counts to a lot of menus. And so you would walk into Dunkin' Donuts and see the calorie yeah. counts, but that didn't change people's behavior because once you have decided to walk into a Dunkin' Donuts, you are eating <laughs> the Dunkin' Donuts. You're not going to be like, wow, turns out there's a lot of calories in the donut. You know that and you're walking in. And so this is what we call the intention action gap. You can have all the information and you can have all the um, intention, but it doesn't actually get you to the action. And so what's so cool about behavioral science is that it's a set of tools that act actually help you overcome that intention action gap. So for example, when I go into the hesitator tendency and how to overcome it, I say deadlines are really powerful especially short deadlines. And mm -hmm. there's an example in the book where these researchers were looking at people who were given a gift card to a bakery. And some were given a gift card to a bakery that you could redeem within three weeks and some you could redeem within two months. And you would think, okay, two months, more time to redeem it from the bakery. Um, I bet more people redeemed it when they got that. But what actually happens is that when it's two months, you say, oh, I can do it whenever, and you put it off. When it's three weeks, you say, oh, this is going to expire soon. I'll actually prioritize it, put a time on my calendar, and do it. And so deadlines, especially short deadlines, help people achieve their goals. And so if you say, I'm a hesitator, I've been putting off dating, but it's the beginning of 2021, and I want to make this happen, you actually need to put a deadline on your calendar. And I like three weeks as a deadline. Within three weeks, I'm going to download the apps get some new photos, get an accountability buddy who knows that I'm serious about dating, create an identity around a dater. And it's that's what I like about the book. It takes the research and what works, it applies it to dating and it helps you overcome that intention action gap. Yeah, because I think that's really what that becomes a very, that becomes a part that's very difficult, especially if someone is like well aware and they're, they're an intelligent person and they've been, you know, kind of hitting that wall. And to what you were just saying, you know, you also talk about this in the book, the whole idea of reversible decisions versus irreversible decisions. It's the same thing. We think, or I do this all the time, like I always have like, I, I buy a buyer's remorse. I like, I like to go to stores where I know I can return something just because it makes me feel like just in case I don't want it, right? Um, and you're saying, and like you talk about, this, we're less committed to the choices that we think that we can actually like change, right? So that's... So sometimes, oh, yeah. right? So let's talk about that because, sure. you know, 
people who know that they they're kind of stuck in a situation. It's they t- t- talk talk about the research. It's yeah. You can, you yeah, know, I, about I'm I'm glad you brought this up. This is one of my favorite pieces of research from the book. I'm working on an article specifically just on this topic, and it's uh, we can talk about a couple things like this, but this is something where I've discovered the research, included in the book, and it's changed how I live. So it's already something that I am embodying in my daily life, even though you know I'm married and I'm not dating, it's applicable in a lot of ways. So the research is from Dan Gilbert, who's a professor at mm-hmm. Harvard, who's just such an interesting person. He wrote this book, Stumbling on Happiness, such an interesting guy. And basically what he- That's and- a good book too, by the way. I like yes. that book. Yeah. Definitely recommend Stumbling on Happiness. And a, a few of the ideas throughout the book are influenced by, by his research. So he and his colleagues at Harvard had a few weekends in which students were invited to participate in a photography workshop. And in some of the weekends, students took photos. And at the end of the weekend, they said, we're going to have an exhibition in London. You can choose one of the photos to send to London. And you have to make the decision now. You can't change your mind. In the other scenarios, different students on a different weekend were told, choose a photo now, but we're going to call you in a few days. And if you want to change your photo, you can. And so what they measured were, did students actually change their photos in the second condition and how satisfied were they with the photos they chose? And what they found was that actually not a lot of people changed their minds, but the people in that second condition who could change their minds were less happy with their selection. And so the question becomes why? And the point is that when you have to make a choice, you commit to it. Your brain goes into rationalization mode and it starts quieting all the reasons why you shouldn't do it. And it starts reinforcing all the reasons why you should do it. And you just, you convince yourself you made the right decision. It's a very beautiful and powerful thing your brain does. It rationalizes your choices. But when you can reverse your decision, you spend all that time saying, should I have picked this photo? Should I have picked that photo? Was my instinct correct? What will the London audience like? Or in your situation, Should I return the coat? Should I keep the coat? Do I already have a coat like this? Can I borrow my friend's coat that's similar (laughs) to this, right? And you have those pro cons in your head and you're not going into rationalization. It's harder to feel satisfied about your decision. So um, the first lesson there is that we want reversible decisions. We want to reply maybe to the event. We want to be able to return the coat. We want to be able to change our mind about the photographs. And that's even true. In this study with Dan Gilbert, they said, would you prefer to be able to change your photo or not? And people said yes, even though the results were that people who could change their minds were less satisfied. And so we're wrong about what makes us happy. We think we want reversible decisions. Irreversible decisions make us happier. And in the book, how I apply this is don't talk to your ex. You think you want to keep your options open. You think you want to keep this person orbiting around you. But if you actually shut the door, you will rationalize that choice, you will move on, and you will create space for somebody else to enter your life. I love that rational, that, that whole thing about rationalizing, because that is so true, right? Like when you're stuck with something, you're like, well, you know, this is a better choice for me anyway. You know, I had to do it because of this, and that's because of that, you know. But then what happens with people who are married, right? And like, you know, they're not sure if they're, you know, they're, they're happy, but they're not so happy, and they rationally, like, you, can, you can trick your brain both ways, right? And when you are in a, when you have a commitment, you know, you can also do the opposite, right? Where does that come into play? Yeah, that is true. And I think that that's, um, I haven't done exact research into that, but I think it might be that maybe you're just farther removed from the decision. So maybe your brain isn't actively convincing you of that. But Mm. that's why in the book, I talk about this idea of a relationship contract and people often have like a really visceral to the reaction to that. Like, why are you applying legalese to love? And like, what's a relationship contract? But like, first thing I would say is it's not a legal contract. It's just really a concept. And the idea is that if we're really going to be married to somebody for 40, 50, 60 years, and we're changing all the time, the relationship needs to adapt and change with us. And so the idea is the relationship contract is that you put down some information about what matters to you, what you want to work on, you know, your sex life, your finances, whatever is important to you. And then you say, you know, in one or two or three years, we're going to revisit this and see how we're doing. And what I like about that is not only does it make those conversations more explicit, It also means that you're constantly choosing the other person. And Mm -hmm. so perhaps we could hypothesize that by making it more of a choice each time, you are saying to yourself, do I want to be here? You say yes, and then you are recommitting to the person and that rationalization instinct will kick in again. 
And I think it's, do you know, I think this happens with any kind of success, right? Uh, professional success, personal success. There has to be some kind of structure and guideline to you achieving those goals, right? So, uh, you know, I, I saw that you wrote that and I, I, I agree with that because you need, if otherwise it becomes like willy nilly, right? Why should you be only focusing? Like, why do you have all these? Cause we talk about, you know, a lot of success habits on this podcast, obviously. Um, and people have a very specific way they do things, like a routine, a structure in order to be on point, to be the most productive. Why wouldn't that not apply to your personal life, right? To be as on point, to be as productive, to be as your best version of yourself, right? Like, it makes yeah. sense to do it. 100%. And I think about this a lot. Like there's this concept work works. Like there's a lot of things mm-hmm. about capitalism and the corporate structure that work. And some of it is having managers, having check-ins, having performance reviews, right. having structure. And so I 100% think we should think that we should take the best of that corporate world and apply it to relationships. The one thing I would say, though, for people listening is that I have a chapter called This is a Date, Not a Job Interview. Mm-hmm. And so we should be taking the best of habit formation and goal goal orientation and things like that. But also don't make your dating life too corporate. When you're going on a date, don't treat it like a job interview. Don't treat it like an interrogation. Um, I like to say play, don't play games. I think we really do need to make dates more fun rather than saying like, I am interviewing you for the role of the husband. And do you meet my job requirements for this role? Well, the problem, like, okay, I, I, I agree with you, but let, how about the whole thing though, about, you're right. People become much more, it becomes, it becomes like a job interview or like, you're kind of like having to interview the person that takes up the fun of it. Right. Mm -hmm. But how about the fact that coupled with that is what's happening just in today's time? Like we said, I said at the beginning of this podcast with social media, right? You compare and despair. Like, how does anyone find any relationship at this, you know, at this juncture, right? Now with the pandemic, you know, it's a whole other story, right? Because you're not going out. But, you know, again, it's like what the information we know, we know that we compare ourselves to other people. That's like human nature, social media. We know that what you see, the grass isn't always greener, right? How do we kind of overcome, A, the grass is always greener, you know, method all like that whole concept and kind of like under kind of get over the whole social media po- yeah. problem well, of comparison. Okay, am, I, am I allowed to curse on your podcast? Yes, you may. <laughs> okay, <laughs> Depends so, on what you're saying. But yes, uh, yeah. Think, so, yeah, yeah. Um, Esther Perel, who you're probably familiar oh, yes. with, wrote Mating in Captivity, she talks about how we used to live in villages and there wasn't very good soundproofing and there were couples all around you and you could hear every fight and every fuck. And mm-hmm. you just understood that relationships <laughs> had these different dynamics. And then compare it to now where not only are we isolated in these little concrete boxes where it's just you alone or you and your partner, but the only part of a relationship that you're seeing is the extremely curated slice Mm -hmm. of life that somebody posts on Instagram. And so even if intellectually you understand, oh, I only post flattering pictures of myself. I don't post pictures of myself up late at night saying, you know, what am I going to do with myself and what's going on? It's really hard when you're scrolling through Instagram and you see all these couples and it feels like everyone else has found someone or maybe the stage where all of your friends are having kids and you haven't found a partner yet. And it's so hard not to look at that and say, oh, that person has what I want and I don't have it. And so the first step is just understanding like Instagram is not reality and spending a lot of time on there comparing and despairing doesn't serve you. And so that might you know, what might help you is just unblock, uh, you know, blocking people whose profiles make you feel bad about yourself, spending less time on there. And I think just intellectually understanding that what people are portraying on social media is who they want you to think they are versus who they are. And I, I forget the exact research, but I think they saw something that was like, Couples who start posting a lot of pictures on Facebook are more likely to break up than couples who don't, and that it's actually a sign of trying to portray something other than reality. And so this kind of goes back to the intention action gap. It's you might you might know that this is true about social media. It doesn't mean you do anything about it, but the doing something about it is the things like blocking people that don't make you feel good, spending less time on there and actually spending time with real couples and seeing from your friends who are in relationships 
what are the good parts? What are the bad parts? What are you struggling with? And if you are someone who's married, then be more vulnerable. Share with your friends, hey, my husband has this trait that I find really stressful and this is what I'm going through. And by actually sharing the hard parts about relationships with your single friends, you help them know that when they get into a relationship and they experience that, that's inevitable and that's normal. That's not a sign of failure. No, no, I know. I feel that we always want what we don't have, right? Like the people who are single want to be married. The people who are married want to be single, right? I mean, that's just, again, I find that to be very much human nature, right? We just want what we can't have. I mean, I'm talking more about the grass is always greener. Like you could be married still Mm -hmm. and, you know, I could be like, oh, that it, it, it's in anything. This, like I said, these all these um these are all overarching concepts that can apply to anything, right? Totally. Like that person looks like they're more successful than I am. That person looks like they're skinnier than I am. That person looks like they're happier because they are skinnier than I am. <laughs> like we put so many different like right, like we just create our own stories of what we see, and we have like you know we know like six percent of the pie. But how does people get? How do we get over the grass is always greener? Like I, I guess this is a question again to people who are or who are already self-aware, who mm-hmm. are already intelligent, who know their behavior is flawed and yet they can't stop themselves. And I don't want I don't mean to make you repeat yourself from what oh, you okay. said, but the whole and, and like just like the grass is green, the whole thing like um, the whole grass is greener on the other side. My mother would always say the grass is always greener until you see their water bill, right? Like you never really know what's that. happening. But it's the truth. I mean, how, and I think this is what stops a lot of people from meeting their maid a lot of times, right? Because you could be in a good relationship just to start seeing somebody and then you, you know, you kind of like sabotage it because you go back on you and you swipe again left and that person looks prettier or, or better, you know, better suited. We talk a little bit about that and then um, also go into how we overvalue certain traits and how we undervalue certain traits for long-term success. Absolutely. Yeah. So one of the things that I talk about the book is how the way that dating apps are designed can actually really confuse us. And so one of the ways that that happens is when you have so many choices, you experience the paradox of choice. And that's the idea that we think we want choice, right? We just talked about the reversible decisions, but actually too many choices makes us doubt our decisions and sometimes experience decision paralysis in which we make no decision at all. Another yeah, analysis thing, paralysis, right? We talked about that a lot. hundred percent. Yes. And it's so true. And it's so true in our culture in a way that like our brains are just not designed to choose among thousands of people. That is just not how dating or marriage has worked until, you know, literally the last decade. So another thing that happens with dating apps is that people are reduced to two dimensional objects. And so there used to be something called relationshipping, which is the process of finding a partner. And now people are experiencing relation shopping. You right. look for a partner like you look for a purchase. And so when you look for a purchase, you think, okay, this I'm going to break this person down into specs. What college did they go to? What did they study? How much money did they make? How tall are they? Do we have mutual friends? And The thing is, humans are not what we call searchable goods, things like a microphone, Bluetooth headset, you know, a camera. They can't be broken down into specs. They're what we call experiential goods. You have to actually experience them to see if you like them, like wine or a movie. You might love a movie and I don't like it, and that's because it's an experience good. It's not objectively one way. It's how do I like it versus how do you like it? Another thing that I talk about is something called the Monet effect, which is that When you have a blurry photo of someone that's literally a photo and metaphorically, you know, you don't have the full picture, your brain fills in the gaps to make it more positive than it is in reality. So Mm -hmm. you match with somebody on the app and you start thinking, oh my God, this is my perfect girl. She's amazing. We have all these things in common. We're going to go skiing together and you create this fantasy in your head and then you meet the person and they are great but they are different from what you thought they would be. They don't match the fantasy that you created. And because of that, you reject them because they aren't this 
picture of who you thought they were. And so I say, you know, you go to the bathroom, you do the wipe and swipe, you know, you're, you're swiping on Tinder <laughs> as you're going to the bathroom and you say, oh, the next person looks perfect. And it's, it's a trick. This is the grass is always greener part. You think the next person's going to be perfect as opposed to the rational thing, which is so far I've been on a lot of dates. None of these people are perfect. And no one's perfect. Even Prince Charming has morning breath. And yeah. instead of overcoming that and saying, no one's perfect. I just need to choose someone and commit and put the effort in and make it work. Instead, you're always seeking that perfect person. And truly in my dating coaching, that is probably the most common problem is that people come and they think it's all about choosing the perfect person as opposed to finding a person that they can make life work with and then investing in that relationship to make it great. But and, and I mean, you're, God, you're good. I think you're, you're so, you are, you really are. Yeah. This is great. I feel like though, people, especially guys, I know a lot of, I live in LA and in LA, especially New, where do you live by the way? I live in Oakland in California. Okay. Okay. So LA, New York, whatever. I find it's like a, a, a man, it's a man's world, right? Like guy, guy, girls are getting younger and younger as the guys are getting older and older. Right. And I know a lot of women who are just amazing girls right and they're just single because also like the guys want the, if the guy is good looking and successful he wants a girl who's like a le like you know like 17 eight, like 18 years old barely legal and even though those guys are miserable when they go out with those girls because i hear it all the time and they know that what they're doing and it's the whole thing over and over again the guys the guy's going to be single until he's you know 97 never meeting anybody but dating all these randoms again it's like you you keep on it's like beating your head against a, you know a, a wall you know what you're doing and it's very very difficult to kind of stop that behavior is there like ways you can can are there like tips or not not tips or tricks but like actual i don't know tools or yeah. like exercises people can do to break their bad habits of what they're doing Absolutely. And yes, what you're talking about, I see in my coaching practice on both sides. I have the women who are coming and saying, I'm in my late 30s. I feel like I'm being filtered out. All the guys have a filter of, um, I don't want to see anyone over 35. And they just suddenly feel like their prospects are low. And then I also have those guys with a little bit of Peter Pan syndrome who are like, well, a little bit who have a lot of Peter Pan <laughs> nerve who are like, well, the people I'm attracted to are the ones who are 21. So I'm going to go out with them. And they kind of aren't able to see the fact that those relationships keep not working and like they're getting older as you said and 21 year olds are staying the same age yes um, we're getting younger and by the way those guys if they're like yeah. and i'm talking about people i'm talking about people who have self-awareness i'm not talking yeah. about these like you know vapid guys who are just dating young girl i mean I, I want, and this is where I want to want to get into this part also about like you know attraction, like the mm -hmm. physical attraction part. Like, mm -hmm. well, who we can't help who we I, and I we can't yeah. help who we're attracted to, but these people like that phase, right? So they go out with these guy, these girls or whatever, and then you know within a week or two they're bored anyway. So they're not they're not any happier with the young girl if they just went out with a person who is much more their their equal, who they can have things in common with and have like a proper relationship. So sorry, I don't mean to interrupt you. No, no, Obviously, no. I'm mad about this because I I'm have a ton of friends in, in this. Yeah, I'm completely in agreement yeah. with you. And I feel like the fact you and I know people on both sides, right? The women who are being left behind because they're being aged out. And then the men who don't understand that like they are playing the role of mentor and that that's actually not satisfying and you want a partner, not a mentee. Yeah, I, I totally am frustrated by the same concept. So what might be helpful for people to hear about is this it's called a line of mathematical inquiry. It's it's kind of a, a decision-making riddle called the secretary problem. And so this is the idea of imagine that you're hiring a secretary and you have 100 candidates. And the trick is you have to interview them one at a time and you have to decide after each one if you're going to say yes or no. So if you get to number 99 and you realize number 16 was the best, you can't go back. And so what makes it challenging is, well, you don't want to choose too early because you might not know what's out there, but you don't want to choose too late because it might be that all the good ones have gone away. And so when you apply this mathematical theory to it, the correct answer is 
30s after 37% of people. So after you've seen 37% of the candidates, you look back and say, who was the single best candidate from the first 37%? This person then becomes your meaningful benchmark. And then you say, I'm going to hire the next person who is as good or better than that meaningful benchmark. And what's important about this is it helps you understand that you need to see some of what's out there, but not all of what's out there in order to make a decision. And so in this book, Algorithms to Live By, they apply the secretary problem to dating and they say, you probably don't know the total number of people you'll date, but you might think about the number of years that you'll date. And they say, let's say you're going to date from 18 to 40. Then by the age of 26, you should have dated 37% of the people you're going to date. So after 26, look back and say, who's my meaningful benchmark? Who's the best person I've dated so far? And then invest and try to be with the next person who's as good or better than your benchmark. And that's totally different from how people are approaching dating. They're thinking about dating as like, turn over every stone, right? This is the maximizer. I have to do my research. But if you think most of us are probably past 26, we've dated a lot of people. We've probably dated someone who would be a perfectly good partner. And now I just have to find someone as good as that benchmark and invest in them. That actually really flips the script about needing to turn over all stones to saying, I need to find someone that I'm going to make it work with and invest in them. And kind of my final thought on this is that there's this obsession with making the objective best decision. What matters so much more is how you feel about your decision. So it's so much more important to say, I made a decision, I feel good about my standards, and I'm going to invest to make it work versus that could I be 5% happier with somebody else is the grass greener with my old college girlfriend. Forget about your college girlfriend. Find someone who makes you as happy as her. Invest in it. And the beauty of relationships is they're up to you. You can make them as good as you want to. It's not just who you choose. It's the effort you choose to put in. Yeah, that's a great point, actually. I like that also, that whole that 37% uh, rule thing. Uh, then how, let's talk about this whole attachment theory, though. I mean, that's really like how we, that's how you feel. Like when you talk about who we're attracted to, why we're, our tendency is to go there. Can you tell us a little bit about that? Sure. Yeah. Am I going too much into the research or do you like it? No, I personally, I, this <laughs> okay. is why I wanted to have you on. Like if you, if you didn't have all this research, okay, I, yeah. I honestly, it wouldn't be that interesting for me. Like what I like about it, like I love to understand like why we do what we do and how we can kind of like go in there and maybe tweak it just a little bit, a percent or two, just to be better, you know? And like I said, you're like a lot, so much of the stuff that you have and you, what you talk about, you can you back it up so well with like real science and 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 great examples that it's easy for me to wrap my I, not easy for me to wrap my head around but it's like it makes it meaningful there's like meat to the bone is it versus just like you know this airy fairy you know yeah you know just like this is why i think this is why i think this is so that's great info for people who are not even trying to find a, uh, you know, a date, a, a boyfriend or a girlfriend or a husband or a wife, but it can apply to so many other relationships in your life. Thank you. Like, yeah. yeah. So I'm, I'm happy to go into it. And, you know, just sometimes people like to see like the work behind the work. And when I was writing the book, I kept inserting the attachment theory chapter and my editor kept taking it out because she was like, somebody can read the book attached. You know, there's a bunch of other books out there. And I was like, this is just so important to me. And this changed my life. This changed my sister's life. This changed other people's lives that if I'm really giving someone the book that I think will help them with dating, I have to include attachment theory. And so I'm kind of prefacing yeah. by saying like, like it, this shift and this knowledge has helped so many people break a bad habit. So the basics of this is that it comes from developmental psychology from this person named John Bowlby. Mm -hmm. And what he did was he was investigating the attachment between mothers and babies. And so how um, his study and this, this other woman who came after him, how the study worked is they would bring mothers and babies into a lab. And they would set the baby down and have the baby play. And the mother would leave the room and they would see what happened. So in one scenario, the mother leaves the room. The baby starts crying. The mother walks in, picks up the baby, and the baby is still upset and still crying. And these are what we called anxiously attached. In another scenario, the mother walks out, the baby cries, the mom walks in, picks up the baby, and the baby is soothed and calms down. And this is called securely attached. And the third one is the mom walks out, the baby 
um, doesn't cry, pretends not to notice, but we know from different uh, measures within the baby that the baby is very stressed and upset and the mom comes back in and the baby ignores the mother. And this is what's called avoid and attached. And so they looked at this over time and they found that these styles of attachment can actually play out in your romantic adult relationships. And so how it works is that those people, those anxiously attached babies, they're constantly worried about being abandoned. And so these are the people who say, text me as soon as you land. Why didn't I hear from you when you were at the concert? They always want to be in touch. They're always afraid of being left alone. They get into relationships quickly because they're afraid of being alone. And when somebody upsets them, they do what's called protest behavior. They they text a million times and then ignore the person. They just constantly want to be in touch and have this anxiety about being alone. The avoidant attached people, their fear is that somebody's going to smother them. And so they constantly want to create space. You know, you're I, I you're, you're too on top of me. Like I, I need to break up with you because I need to focus more on work. And they're constantly pushing back. And then securely attached people, they're sort of the heroes. They are comfortable with intimacy, but they also are comfortable with space. So they want to be close to you, but they can also have the alone time. And so 50% of the population is securely attached. But many of these people are not the people you find in the dating apps because they're already in relationships. So what you have is this anxiously attached person who's constantly coming after you and this avoidantly attached person who thinks that relationships are somebody smothering them and they date each other. And it's called the anxious avoidant loop, right? Why do I always have to chase guys? Why are they never interested in me? And the guy, why when I always date people, are they always smothering me? And it's because they're dating each other. And so truly one of the best pieces of advice I can give people is know what your attachment style is. I have the quiz on my website. You can also read the book attached, figure out what your style is. Is figure out how to overcome it and date a secure person. And for me, when I started dating my now husband, I am anxiously attached. I had that whole anxious avoidant loop. And one time I was walking down the street and I was mad at him and I sent him a bunch of angry texts. Why didn't you do this? Why didn't you do that? And I knew we were going to get into a fight because that's how my pattern worked. And he responded and said, sounds like this is something we should discuss in person. And this just blew my mind because he just totally de-escalated the situation. <laughs> I think it has to do with the fact that his mom's a therapist. He's a great communicator. But I, it was my first time dating somebody securely attached, and it just totally blew my mind. And now we're married because I needed to be with a secure person in order to get over those really bad, anxiously attached habits. And honestly, the amount of time that I spend in that anxious zone is so much smaller now. And it gives me so much more space to enjoy life and think and produce things like a book. And truly, if you are in this anxious avoidant loop, I so encourage you to find a secure partner. Now that can, first of all, you just said, you just summed it up so, so beautifully. <laughs> uh, no, you did. First of all, I think it's interesting how what you just said in these, for, especially when it comes to the apps and who's on those apps, right? Because the securely attached people, there's, we're, there's, they're fifty percent of us, or you know, of of them, or whatever. Yeah. But they're not really available because they're already in relationships. So then you get stuck, kind of, with like the people who are on uh, uh, like either side of the pendulum, right? The avoidance people and the anxiety people who then of course find each other so how are we to how are people supposed to find because now like it's it's a foreign object a concept for me right because i've never been on an app in my life you know mm -hmm. even when their apps were popular i was meeting people just through day-to-day -day life and now that's not even an option i mean for pandemic or not pandemic people of all ages are using these apps and you you work at Hinge for, for crying out loud. I mean, this is what you do. Like, there's not many opportunities uh, for a lot of people, depending on what the work they're in, to meet people, let alone meeting a securely attached. Where what, what are people to do? You can't you can't create them. Yeah. So there's a couple different things. One Pray? Is, yeah. So one is that. 50% of the population is securely attached, but not 50% of the people on the apps. But that doesn't mean there's nobody on the apps who's securely attached. But it's, if few, it's few and far between. It is. Yeah. I mean, and so, so one part is just understanding like, 
you know, you talked about your friends who are getting divorced. That's actually like a great way to find someone. And some of the best people out there are like the divorced moms, the divorced dads, somebody who's securely attached, got into that relationship quickly. It didn't work out. And now it's called attrition. Basically, you're supposed to wait, you're supposed to wait until someone becomes available. (laughs) Yeah. Wait for the marriage churn. There you go. So there is that. So I don't want people listening to say, oh, there's nobody on the apps who's secure. But really the trick here is to understand your pattern. So for me, being anxiously attached, my pattern was needing always to be in touch and then protest behavior when I wasn't in touch. And so things that you can learn how to do if you're anxiously attached are understanding how to self-regulate. So if you feel like you're being triggered, maybe call a friend instead of your partner. If you feel like you're like, I just don't understand, like he's on a trip, but it takes 15 seconds to text me. Like just learning how to calm yourself down in any capacity, especially relationships is a super healthy thing. So saying like, I know I'm wired this way, but let me try to overcome it. And for the people who are avoid and attached, they're also, they're often getting out of relationships and to say, I'm not going to do that because if I keep doing this over and over, I'll never wind up with someone. And so I'm actually going to go outside my comfort zone and commit to someone. But you can also see what are the qualities of a securely attached person. And this is probably the critical thing is that if somebody's giving you these bullshit answers like, oh, I'll be there, but then they don't show up. Or if somebody's not the person you want to be dating, but they always seem to be making dates with you. Those are not the people you want to be with. You want to be with the person who is comfortable with intimacy tells you their feelings, but is also comfortable with space and has independence and isn't smothering you. And you really want to look for those qualities of a secure person because that's going to give your relationship such a better chance of being successful. Uh, Yeah. And then, so how do people self-regulate? I think that's, you know, it sounds great and wonderful, but it's, that's why meds are there, right? Because people cannot self-regulate, right? It's very difficult to, to quiet your emotions and to like, you know, the whole, what did you, what, what you just call it? You said like managing disruptive impulses and emotions, right? Like there's a lot of women I know uh, and men, I guess, when you're wired a certain way, again, this takes certain exercises to do to be able to self-regulate, right? So they don't have to take their medication because I wasn't even joking. Like that's why people are on anxiety yeah. medication, especially now is because they they are not wired that way, Right. Yeah. So, and I, I don't mean to make this sound easy. Like, I don't think this no, is, I, know you don't. I, I don't know think you this don't. is easy at all. And if you actually look at the research, changing your own attachment style is really hard, right? Like it comes from the nature part of how you're wired. It comes from the nurture part of your relationships with the caretakers growing up. Like, honestly, this is deeply ingrained in people and that's why they struggle with it so much. But just understanding oh, I tend to go after people who aren't interested in me. My version of love is that love feels like the chase. And so when I go after someone and they pull away, that makes me really excited. And that's chemistry. And that's my definition of love. And then if you can actually reframe that and say, no, that's an avoidant person. I've been here a million times. That person is not interested in me. I'm addicted to the chase. Forget it. I don't want to make somebody a priority who makes me an option. I am going to choose to end the chapter with this person and start a new chapter with someone else who's secure and shows up for me. And so that's really the work. I think self-regulating is super hard. I understand why a lot of people are anxious, especially during the pandemic. And so if you can actually get better at choosing someone who brings out a secure side of you instead of trying to be secure yourself, that's maybe a more realistic outcome. Absolutely. And also just, I think, recognizing what your trigger is. That recognition to, to know that you're like, okay, now I'm like behaving this way. It's me, not them, can save you. You can save your relationship, probably, I would imagine. Yeah. Right. I have a friend whose husband is traveling right now and she just set the expectation with him. She's like, I know you're far away. I know you're in a really different time zone. I know you're busy. I want to talk at least every 24 hours. That's what I want to hear from you. And so for her, she has a recognition that Mm -hmm. when he's traveled and that didn't happen, it triggered this anxious attachment. And so she's saying, my expectation is this. I think it's reasonable. Can you try to reach that? And so that's just a, a tiny little trick, but it's basically saying like, know that you're sensitive to certain triggers and then create an environment, create that expectation with your partner so that they can meet it. And then you never get into that red zone of, 
flooding with emotions, yeah. being a person you don't want to be, right? Like when I told that story about walking down the street, sin, sending those angry texts, like I don't want to be that person. I don't want to be in that state of mind. And the more that you can find a partner that keeps you out of the red zone and truly brings out the best side of you, like that's the person that you should commit to. Yeah. I mean, well, and I want to get into all that, the overvaluing traits and all that. But before I do, can you can we talk a little bit um, about pheromones and chemistry? Because wh wh where where is this stat? Where where is that in this whole you know picture? I mean, with with all this knowledge and like I was like going on about the science about behind it and the algorithms and all that other stuff and human nature. Also, what human nature is like you can't help who you're you're attracted to, right? Like can we talk about where that is in all this, this pheromone yeah. thing. In yeah, chemistry. absolutely. So yeah, there's, there's a couple different directions I can take that in. And so one of them is there's a really interesting study about who are we attracted to and thinking about smells and pheromones. And so they do this study where they have men wear the same t-shirt for a few different days in a row and sleep in the t-shirt and sweat in the t-shirt. And then they give, uh, different women, each six t-shirts and say, which one are you most attracted to? Which smell smells the best to you? And what they found was that you are most attracted to the person who is the most genetically different from you. And so this has an evolutionary background, which is um, in order to create offspring who have a robust genetic makeup, it pays off to have um, your genes mesh with someone else's genes who are really different to you. And so that's just interesting to hear that um, it's there's a genetic reason why we are attracted to some people or not. And I was dating a guy about 10 years ago, super smart, like scientific genius guy. And he broke up with me because he said, I just don't like your pheromones. It's just not working for me. And I really liked him and it was really sad. But looking back, I was like, he was kind of onto something. Like he was just identifying the fact that like, my smell wasn't doing it for him and that there is scientific research behind this. However, and that this is a big caveat, one of my favorite chapters in the book is called Fuck the Spark. And it's kind of a bold title, but it's last year I gave a speech uh, to a bunch of venture capitalists. And by the end, everybody was chanting, fuck the spark. And I was like, there is something to this. And basically many of my coaching clients, I've also done matchmaking. They go on these dates and they say, oh, she was great. We had a good time, but I just didn't feel the spark. Mm -hmm. And so the spark is this word that we all use. It could also be what you called chemistry, where it's like, I met them and I didn't feel this instant pang of excitement. The world didn't stop. I wasn't immediately interested in them. And so there's this false premise that you need the spark spark to have a great relationship. And in the book, I bust a few myths around the spark. And so one of them is if you don't feel the spark, then the relationship is doomed. That's not true. The spark can grow over time. And that's why people who work together or live in the same neighborhood often end up together because attraction grows through something called the mirror exposure effect. The more mm -hmm. you see someone, the more attracted you are to them. The second myth is that um, if you feel the spark, then it's a great thing. That's also not true. Some people are very sparky. They're hot. They're narcissistic. They're charming. They give everyone the spark. And so you think it's a thing between you, but it's actually just that person gives the spark. And then the third one is, if you feel the spark, then the relationship is meant to be. And that's not true. Lots of couples who felt the spark are divorced. Your how we met, your meet cute doesn't really matter. It's like 0.01% of the duration of your relationship. And don't stay with someone because you had a cute, romantic, how we met story. And so instead of optimizing for the spark and rejecting people with whom you don't have the spark, my recommendation is to go for the slow burn. And that's that person, that diamond in the rough, who the more you spend time with them, the more you love them. I mean, I bet that you have people on your team, people you've worked with who are exactly like this, where like, they're just not the most charming, but you're like, damn, like they always follow through on what they say they will. They mm -hmm. make you feel good. They show up. It's like, I feel like my husband is a slow burn. And it's so lucky to be with a slow burn because the more time you spend with them, the more you appreciate them versus those super sparky people where the more time you spend with them, the more you're like, you're kind of full of it. And like a lot of what you're doing is a performance and like, just find that quality person. That's, that's the slow burn and fuck the spark. Right. No, I, that's a great explanation. So those people that you just said are kind of full of it, the hot narcissistic, is that kind of th those, those burn out pretty quickly. 
right? Like that's kind of like, it's like super sparky and then it kind of just kind of falls flat, right? Um, but you're saying, this is what I, you were saying something earlier about the genetic part, right? But then how does that explain why if, if, you, if we're most attracted to people a lot of times who are the most opposite of our genetics, why is it that people who are Jewish are with the Jewish people, people who are Indian are with Indian people? Like we tend to kind of a lot of times also end up with people who are the most similar, like genetically to us, right? Or that we have the most kind of like um, genet heredity, like the religious background, cultural background, which makes us more similar. So isn't that kind of like, you know, counterintuitive? Yeah. yeah, yeah. No, I totally see your point. And I should say as a caveat that I'm not an expert in the science of attraction. That is a whole other field, but I can tell you a few kind of relevant pieces of data. So um, there was a paper that came out a few years ago from Moron Surf from the University of Chicago and some data scientists at Hinge. And it was exploring our people um, it's basically, you know, there's these two concepts, opposites attract and birds of a feather flock together, which yeah. was true. And they found that basically, um, birds of a feather flock together, right? People are very attracted to people who are similar to them. And this was true, like across all of the dimensions that they looked at. And they looked at like the, the big five personality traits. So things like how neurotic you are, how open you are, how extroverted you are. And the only exception was, um, Extroverts sometimes end up with introverts because introverts, it's it, it, with two introverts, they may not be like enough mm -hmm. enough action to actually get together. But so basically, yes, people are attracted to someone who's similar to them. And remember that all of this is that that th that there's a lot of different factors, right? So you have the factor of the pheromones, a scientific piece in which someone smell is attracted to you, but you also have huge societal and cultural things, right? So I'm yeah. Jewish. I went to Jewish day school. I was told that you marry someone Jewish. And that was just something that was put into my mind. Yeah. Same with you from the time that you're little and okay. So now I'm in seventh grade and I'm going through puberty and who are the people I'm attracted to? I'm attracted to the 30 Jewish men in my class. And that's who I develop a crush on. And then who am I attracted to for the rest of my life? Right? Like short, <laughs> Jewish men with two faces, <laughs> right? And so there's this whole, like, it's not just one thing. There's the pheromone piece and the genetic dissimilarity piece, but there's also when you were going through puberty, who was your first crush? Um, were you commended by your parents when you pursued the Jewish guy over the not Jewish guy? Um, is it easier to be with someone who knows the prayers on Hanukkah? Yes. And so there's all these factors, right? There is the genetic piece. There's cultural piece. There's the ease of being with someone with the same um, type of family, same type of humor, all of that stuff. And that's what makes relationships so hard is that you have a lot of factors at play and now you have all these choices and you have to navigate this world on your own, a decision that used to be decided by a matchmaker, your family, your community. Now it's all on you. Yeah, no, it's a hundred percent. I think that's a hundred percent true, right? I mean, the societal factor, the cultural factor, I think is so heavy. It can supersede any other piece of that pie. You know what I mean? Um, and then let, let's talk a little bit about the overvalue, undervalue of, of qualities, right? We tend to, it was interesting, we tend to over, I, I'm surprised at this, we tend to overvalue weather, because I moved here from Canada, right? And, you know, it's, people, you know, you, you, you would think that I would, people are coming here to be so much happier, da, da, da. but when they did the testing, and they did the case study, People who lived in Michigan versus people who lived in California, there was no, ha the happiest barometer was not any different. And there's other, I mean, that's just not to, that has nothing to do with relationships per se, but it does talk about how we tend to over and undervalue traits we think are going to make a difference in our happiness. Yeah, I can talk to all of that. So as I mentioned before, I do some matchmaking. And so when that happens with matchmaking or dating coaching, somebody comes to me and says, like, I know exactly what I want. I want these traits. And so often they are, um, very superficial things. So there must be over six feet tall, um, must make six figure income, um, must have, you know, must love camping, must be a lumber sexual who wears plaid shirts. Right. And there, there are all these really a what? A lumber sexual have you heard of that lumber sexual. This was big, like a few years ago. It's like the kind of guy with like the scruffy beard who could, you know, fix your fence and wears plaid shirts and kind of, yeah, like a like a 
a furry, cute guy. But anyway, yeah. the the point is that a I lot do of, remember that actually. That yeah. Say, yeah, I do. A okay. lot of these traits that people go after are not what matters and are not at all correlated with long-term relationship success. And so there's a few reasons why. So one is that looks fade and lust fades. And a lot of sexual attraction is novelty. There's a study that my husband loves to cite to me, which is that if you put um, a rat in a cage and you put a male rat and a female rat, they'll have sex for a certain amount of time and then the male rat will get over it. If you put a male rat in a cage and keep putting a new female rat in, the male rat will keep having sex with the new rat until it literally dies of exhaustion. Really? And, yes. And this is about the fact that people, so yeah. much of sexual attraction is novelty and just having someone new to have sex with. And so I forget if I took this out of the book or not, but it's like, whenever you see a hot person, there's a person who's sick of having sex with them. Yeah, that's like an old, like, that's what the joke I think was like, you know, someone, even someone's sick of having sex with like Cindy Crawford or whatever. Yeah, it was yeah, like before, yeah. you know what I mean? Like, or exactly. like, there's always someone that, that exactly, but it's the truth, right? Yeah. Because everything gets, everything's novel for a certain amount of time. And then it becomes day, it becomes like your day to day that that happens with me. That happened with me too. A lot of times in my life, right? Like, yeah. you know, you're with this, like, whatever you're with. And then like, after a while, you're like, well, okay, right. it becomes normal. And these are, this is goes back to some of the themes we've been talking about, right? Like we're wrong about what will make us happy long term. And we confuse the change from one thing to another with how it will always feel. So one thing that people do is they confuse falling in love with being in love. Falling in love is a very discreet emotion in which things are really overwhelming. You can't stop thinking about the person. It's it's very physiological. But when you've been with someone for a while, it's not the same. And so people get trapped where they're like, I used to feel this way, but now I don't. And so I should find the next person that I can fall in love with as opposed to understanding that being in love is going to be different. And that's what's called the transition rule. And it's some of the famous research on this is about winning the lottery. So you say to someone, how would it feel to win the lottery? How would your life change? And they think mm -hmm. about all the ways, oh, I would go on this vacation and I'd buy my mother a house and I would be a totally different person. I'd be so much happier. But yes, winning the lottery creates a spike in happiness, but then you adapt to your surroundings and it's you... It, it, it's not that transition of not a lottery winner to a lottery winner. Eventually you adapt. And so that's really important. You know, even if the person's really hot, you're going to get used to how they look. And so looks are overrated. Another thing is money. And there's lots of research that it's less about how much money you have. And it's about how much money the people around you have. And the same thing applies. You adapt to the amount of money you have. I don't think most rich people are walking around saying, I'm so lucky that I can afford to take this Uber instead of taking a bus, right? They're just used to taking Ubers whenever they want. And so this is just a general rule to think about. A couple of the other ones that people overestimate having similar personalities. Um, I had a lot of clients who say, I'm so extroverted. I'm the life of the party. My girlfriend's shy and she likes to go to bed early. Should I just find someone who will stay out till 1 a.m. with me? And I'm like, dude, you are so much. Two of you in a relationship would be way too much. She is perfect for you. She creates this beautiful home that you come home to. She grounds you. She balances you out. Like it's 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 incorrect that similar personalities is related to long-term relationship success. And then another one is shared hobbies. You don't have to both love wine as long as you give the other person space to have their hobby. And so sometimes people say, you know, I love this person, I feel great around them, but we just don't have enough in common. Well, maybe stop prioritizing how much you have in common. And so that's the category of superficial stuff that people think matters more than it does. The next category of what matters more than people think it does are things like emotional stability, kindness, loyalty, the ability to make hard decisions together, a growth mindset. And finally, what really has become the most important one to me, what side of you that person brings out. Because a relationship is what emerges when two people are together. And that's who you'll be in life when you're with that person. So choose someone who brings out the best side of you. No, I mean, I yeah, I, I, I really like that. And the thing is, like, some of this stuff is like, I thought was pretty common sense, but maybe common sense isn't so common, right? Like, you want to be with someone who's kind and loyal. Mm -hmm. But I guess at the end of the day, you know, uh, uh, we're maybe programmed to go to the other stuff, like the, the, the looks and like, you're to your point, like, when you talk to when I talk to a single person, 
a girl, what, what a girl wants though, and what a guy's looking for, guys want a girl who's visually appealing and girls want a guy who's like, you know, financially successful, right? Cause mm-hmm. it makes it feel stable. Mm-hmm. And, you know, they say that is, you know, $75,000, there's no difference in happiness. And I've read this so many times, you talk about this too, but you know, like is, as long as your basic needs are met and you're making a certain minimum in terms of money, there's no difference in happiness in terms of financial. But yet a lot of women, you know, would want to have a gut. They think that what they need and what they actually, what they want and what they need are so, so different, like a guy in different ways. Yeah. And I, yeah. honestly, I totally agree with what you said, where it's like on the service level, you're like, yeah, obviously loyalty and kindness matter, but just through my time working with people, that's just not what they look for. And they let people get away with so much bad stuff. They go on a date, you know, this woman I was working with, she went on a date with a guy. He insulted the recipe she made. He made fun of the posters on her wall. He criticized her career decisions. And then she's like, well, I really admire his career. So I want to go out with him again. And it's like in that moment, She's only looking at his resume and right. who he is on paper and not focusing on what side of her he brings out and the fact that he's kind of a jerk and not kind. Um, people just get distracted by things. So maybe like they know intellectually to look for kindness and loyalty, but they're being led astray by these other surface level things that they think really matter. Yeah, absolutely. Um, no, I, I think that's great. I, like I said, your book was amazing. I really liked it and, um, I recommend it. It's called how to not die alone. I love it. Um, before I let you go, let's talk about hinge. This is just about, I'm just curious, right? Um, there's so many apps, there's a hinge, there's Tinder, there's, well, those are the two I feel like everyone's using. What kind of metrics are there? Like how many people actually, do you have any metrics on how, like, on anything in terms of the app stuff. Like we talked a lot about the apps here, but yeah, like how many people like actually end up in real relationships? How much is a hookup? Is it like what, what I'm just curious. This is, yeah, I mean, yeah. I, I would be asking yeah. this on or off of this podcast. Oh no, Sure. No, I'll, I'll tell you about it. And I, I do not want this to seem like some sort of hinge ad, but basically no, it's hinge, not. I mean, honestly, I'm yeah. just asking because like yeah, yeah, yeah. So, my friends are on hinge and they're on Tinder. Now they're on, they're on Raya. I mean, what's the difference oh, yeah. between all of these hits? Yeah, like so what's the difference? Hinge's, Hinge's slogan is designed to be deleted. And when I was researching the book, I met with the CEO of Hinge and I was like, I don't believe this. Uh, how could you try to get people off the app? The whole point of an app is growing your user base. That's how you make money. I don't believe in design to be deleted. And he was like, no, as soon as we became the relationship app, the app for people looking to get into serious things designed to be deleted, our user base exploded because even if people join the app, find someone and and go off of it, if they tell Mm -hmm. five of their friends I met on Hinge, then people actually join Hinge. So that's one of the reasons that I work there is that I actually do believe that, um, Hinge is really focused on getting people into relationships. And so I've never been in a meeting at Hinge where anyone says, what's time spent on app? You know, how do we get people on the app more? It's really not about like gamifying it the way it might be with other apps. And so some isn't of the- Hold on, hold on. Isn't it like Tinder? Don't you do swipes also? There is no swiping. You can oh. only, um, yeah. So basically Hinge's oh. whole thing is that it's for intentional daters. It's for people who have maybe graduated from another app and are ready to actually find someone. I was talking to a friend the other day who got out of a breakup and she's like, uh, I got out of the breakup. I joined the app field to see other people, you know, just kind of have casual hookups. And then when I was ready to actually date, I joined Hinge, which is like exactly what we want to hear. And some of the things that differentiate it are, um, there's like, a profile that requires you to fill out a lot of things. 25% of people who sign up for Hinge drop out during the sign up flow because it's actually takes a long time. Um, you have to either like a particular thing on someone's profile or send them a comment. So you're like engaging with who they are. Um, and it's basically, it's trying to be like more work to filter out the people who aren't interested in that. I think the coolest stats they can share with you are around dating during the pandemic. So, Um, There's been a 9% increase in dates from 2019 to 2020, which is super surprising. You would think people were taking the year off from dating. And a lot of those are virtual dates. So you've probably heard this, but there's been an explosion in virtual dating um, before the pandemic. Almost no one had been on a virtual date. Now a majority of people have tried it. Some of these dates are lasting for hours. People are going really deep. And so what happened is a lot of single people spent the first few months of the pandemic alone being like, 
you know, to, to quote my book title, I don't want to die alone. How to not yeah. die alone. And they were like, I was making dating not a priority or, you know, I was just like having sex with random people and not actually like figuring out if I liked them. And that time alone helped them be more self-reflective and figure out who they are and what they want. And now we're seeing people show up in a different way. So ghosting is actually down 27%. And so there's really been some cool silver linings to dating in the pandemic, which is that people are being more intentional, more empathetic, and actually just focusing more on making dating a priority. Um, also, wouldn't you say that because we are in a pandemic, there's not, you don't have as many options or you don't want to be doing it as much. So therefore, what's the per- I, I wonder what the percentage is going to be if once this whole thing is lifted, how many um breakups that will be or how, when, when, or how it's going to go back to how it used to be right now. Like, again, I, I keep on saying my friends, I, I'm going to get in big trouble after this episode. They're like, don't oh, talking about me, but you know, like they're staying with people that they met all through the app, uh, through these apps, because it's like, a, it's not easy right now to date. So it's like you, a bird in the hand, I guess is better than not. Right. I'm cur- I'm just curious what yeah. will happen afterwards. You know, like this is just me. Yeah rambling right now. No, no, no. I, I'm totally with you, right? So, okay, there's going to be people who say, I'll be with anyone so that I'm not alone. They'll get into a relationship. And when they can date again, those people might break up, right? And are you yeah. familiar with the concept of cuffing season? No. Cuffing is season is usually around October. This is less like in California where we live and more yeah. in the, but basically in places that experience winter, right around October, people are like, oh, I need that warm body to spend yeah. the winter months with. And so they get into a relationship, they rush into it. And then when it's spring and you can date again and meet people out and about, those people break up. That's the stigma of cussing season. Oh. So you can think about that applied to quarantine dating where you rush to get into a relationship with someone and you're just with them to have the warm body. And when it, when, uh, COVID is over, then maybe you'll break up. So, right. That's one hypothesis. And I'm sure there are people like that. I think there's a couple other situations that I've been seeing. So one is, um, a close friend of mine, and and he would be fine with me talking about this. He had a bad habit. He was always going after women who weren't interested in him. He, he really just wasn't picking the right people. And when he did wind up with someone who would be good for him. He kind of like let it go or he thought he, he, he picked on their imperfections, all of that stuff. And because dating in quarantine was so hard when he met one of these great people who he probably would have nitpicked, he actually just said, I'm going to invest in this person. And so, right. We talked a lot about habits today. Mm-hmm. The pandemic was the thing he needed to break the bad habit. He invested in that person. They just got a puppy. They're going to move in together. I don't know if they'll ever get married, but they're, you know, they want to have the kid in the next year. Like he basically was able to break the bad habit of choosing the wrong person by the fact that there was limited choice. And then you also are going to have people who <laughs> I know that guy actually. Yeah. 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 And, <laughs> or, and or, are, or, or maybe not that guy, but I know my guy that's like that guy. Yeah. You know? And so those, <laughs> uh, there are people I know who are in the best relationship they've been in, in for 10 years because they had limited choice. Another type of person is someone who was, the hesitator, right? Mm -hmm. Um, I'll prioritize dating later. I'm not perfect. I'm not there yet. Then they were like, this sucks. I'm alone and I don't want to be alone for the next pandemic. And so it actually just became more of a priority in their life. And I hope that that continues after the pandemic where they say, I'm going to give this more time. I'm going to give this more effort. I'm going to be more more vulnerable. And so it created this sense of loss aversion, right? The sense of what if I never get this thing that I want? And just that fear which is very powerful, is getting them to change their mind. And that's why I called the book How to Not Die Alone. I'm actually support, su- sort of triggering you to be like, wait, I could die alone? That's a scary thing. And then hopefully you'll take action. Yeah. Oh, I love it. Well, thank you. So you this has been great. I, have, I had a great time talking to you. Seriously, Logan. Um, the book is called How to Not Die Alone. We just talked about it by Logan Yuri. Uh, it's out. Uh, by the time this podcast airs, it will be out. So we're good. Uh, and where do people find you? Where like give us like where do people get more information? Yeah. You have such you're like sure. a, you're like a fountain of information. Oh, thank you so much. Yeah, people can follow me on Instagram or Twitter at, at Logan Yuri. I also have some fun quizzes on my website, which is loganyuri.com. And yes, I hope people do check out the book How to Not Die Alone. And I also read the audiobook, so they might be interested in that. Well, thank you so much for being a guest today. I really appreciate it. Yay! Yeah, Yay. it was so fun for me. Thank you. 
Habits and hustle, time to get it rolling. Stay up on the grind, don't stop, keep it going. Habits and hustle, from nothing into something. All out, hosted by Jennifer Cohen. Visionaries, tune in, you can get to know them. Be inspired, this is your moment. Excuses, we ain't having that. The Habits and Hustle Podcast, powered by Habitness.